first of all, before we say, before I say anything else, we want to say thank you so much to the Masjid as Salam and the mosque community and Dr. Shamshar Ahmad for allowing us to be here. The Masjid has opened its arms to this event and to us tonight, and we thank them greatly. We're going to witness something pretty extraordinary, and that is the successful end of two fasts. And I understand it's hard to see a fast. Um, it's, we're used, I think as activists, we're used to seeing the results of action. We go out, we do something, we have posters, we, have, we march, we, we do things, and, and it's harder to see something that is not being done for the same reason that we do things. But here, in person, are the results of these fasts. And we're thrilled to have with us tonight Elliot Adams, and Tara Calling uh, around 8.15 or so, uh, and this is our meal um, with, with the, the Muslim community um, in keeping with the observance of the holy month of Ramadan, during which observant Muslims fast from dawn to sundown. Um, you, we, we're going to stay in this room, so the meal will come, will come here. We want to try to make this program and just about the time that the meal will come in. Um, so I know that, I'm sure you have questions, um, any questions for both Tarek and Elliot. Um, so I will just say a little bit, and then I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers, and they will take it from there. Elliot and Tarek wanted to end their fasts here during Ramadan. They're not Muslims, but they are activists. And theirs are acts of civil resistance, not civil disobedience. It's not technically illegal yet <laughs> to fast in solidarity with a cause. Rather, it's the government that is acting illegally. And these two men are resisting the government's illegal existence of Guantanamo prison and the treatment of the detainees there. These two citizens are trying by their deliberate resistance in the form of voluntarily refusing food, as are the hunger strikers at Guantanamo, to get the government to act within the rule of law. Civil resistance is one of the ways they and we who support them can bring our collective voice to bear <clears throat> on those in power who are breaking the law. The stain of Guantanamo continues, but not with our acquiescence, nor Elliot's, nor Tarek's. Among the 166 prisoners still being held at Guantanamo, 86 were cleared for release over a year ago. Over 100 detainees with no hope of release in sight began a hunger strike in February of this year. As of today, which is day 179, 57 are still on strike, 41 are being force fed. On day 25 of the Pelican Bay hunger strike, 600 are on strike and one is dead by suicide. The website that, that both men are, are uh, affiliated with and which is really the best um, for information is closedgitmo.net. The Muslim Solidarity Committee, of which I am a member, wants to know just in passing that today, August 4th, is the ninth anniversary of the arrests of Yassin Araf and Muhammad Hussein in 2004, nine years ago. Two Masjid as Salam members who were later convicted as the result of a phony FBI terrorism sting based right here at the Masjid, where Yassin was the Imam. Um, Dr. Shamshat Ahmad will speak first. He is the president of the Masjid as Salam. He is a university at Albany professor of physics. Elliot Adams is the former mayor of Sharon Springs, New York former president of the National Organization Veterans for Peace and a community activist. 
He began fasting on May 17th. During his 80-day fast, this is the last day, 80 days, he has limited himself to 300 calories and three liters of water a day. Tarek Koff began his liquid-only fast on June 7th and for 59 days has been consuming 300 calories a day. He serves on the board of directors of Veterans for Peace and is one of the founders of War Crimes Times, the organization's newspaper. He's also one of the original members of Middle East Crisis Response, a group of Hudson Valley residents who support human rights for Palestinians and an end to the U.S.'s aggressive policies in the Middle East. Peace be upon all of you. This is our uh, cultural and religious greetings, literally translated. Uh, Peace be upon all of you, and that's what I mean. And I'm pretty sure that's what you mean too. Uh, sundown today is approximately 8.15. At 8.15, uh, call for the prayer will be made. And uh, people who have gathered next door, they will be doing the prayer. Uh, you can do your own prayer by sitting over here, if you feel like, or continue the program. After that, uh, prayer takes only six minutes or so. After the prayer is, fin is finished, food would be served. Uh, to you, it will be served here. Some people from the next door, they will come and join in here. And uh, uh, food will be brought to you here. And, uh, it will be going on for half an hour or so until the food is finished. Uh, the program may continue during the time you are busy in eating or uh, afterwards uh, as long as you feel like. We have a night prayer, begins at 10, so you are welcome to stay here until 10 you feel, you feel like. If you need uh, another course of food, we will go. It's no problem. By the way, Today we have the special night for the Ramadan. So the Muslim community of this mass will be busy in prayer the whole night. Uh, so if you want to stay, and you will be having another meal for uh, roughly 4 o'clock in the morning. So very spicy and delicious food. If you like to enjoy, uh, you are uh, at the good place. Uh, I welcome you with open heart. We are very, very pleased, really, that uh, you came here. Uh, I, with great respect, uh, welcome my two guests here, and uh, then all of you being guests over here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, we very much count uh, on your support for our community and very, we very much try to offer our help whatever, in whatever way and means we can provide to you. So it's a really pleasure that you came here, and I wish and pray that this program is successful. Uh, I am not going to talk about the program or anything else. Since uh, the program is associated with fasting, and we are in the month of fasting, maybe I say a few words, about the month of fasting for the Muslim. Muslims, uh, it is called month of Ramadan, which is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. It is based on solar calendar, so it uh, advances or uh, fall, falls behind, depending upon how we refer to, by approximately 10 days. So this year, for example, it, it started 9th of July. Next year it will uh, start uh, uh, 10 days earlier, that is 29th of June or something like this. So it, it uh, circulates. Uh, when I came about 35 years ago, we were fasting in August. And then we fasted uh, July and uh, January and December and etc. 35 years later it came in August again. So that's a hint to you that I am resident of Albany for the last 35 years. Uh, so uh, again, as I mentioned to you, this month is a very special month for the Muslims and all adult capable Muslims, male and female, 
uh, fast during the whole month of Ramadan, every single day, continuously, from dawn to dusk, without consuming anything orally. No food, no drink, no medicine. Of course, people who cannot uh, uh, afford because of the health reason, because of uh, any other kinds of ailments, because of traveling, because of uh, mothers being uh, pregnant, uh, settling children, etc., they are supposed to compensate later on at, at the convenience, a month later, two months later, a year later, etc. Some of the people who cannot do it because they are too old or terminally ill or, or something, if they can afford, their uh, compensation is to feed poor people. Needy, needy people. So one of the uh, idea behind this this fasting is to uplift oneself morally, surrendering to the commands of the Almighty, who requires, according to our religion, the lawgiver, the God, the Almighty, requires to any capable Muslim to fast one month, month after Ramadan continuously. And therefore, it is the obedience to God, it is the surrender to his order, and it is for the upliftment, morally and responsibly and spiritually, and that is the purpose of the fasting. Other purpose is to be charitable, to feel how the hungry people and needy people in the world suffer, because when you are fasting from dawn to dusk, you know you have food available, you have water available, you have other things available to consume, but you cannot. But think about people who are in the same situation, but they don't have. They cannot afford. And uh, we are living in the most prosperous society in the United States. Perhaps we don't feel, uh, feel very little, but a big world majority of the world is really, even today, in 2013, is in a situation where children are malnourished. They are not able to uh, get full meal. They are a population, millions, over millions, rather I should say hundreds of millions, they don't have two times food. This is the reality on the surface of the earth and the on the planet we live. And therefore, by fasting, our mind goes there because we suffer from morning till evening, continuously 30 days, and therefore one of the purposes is that you think of what is going on to our other uh, members of the society, members of the community, members of the human race who are not as lucky and as prosperous as we are, and therefore we feel for them and be charitable and be helpful by providing them by whatever means, uh, food, drink, water, education, medicine, whatever we can do that. So that is the, basically the purpose of that. We have 27th uh, night tonight, as I mentioned to you, we will be praying the whole, whole night uh, uh, in, in the masjid. And uh, after uh, 30th day or 29th day, depending upon the sighting of the moon, it is based on the solar calendar. We will have the celebration that is called the first Eid, and that is expected here to be on Friday, or maybe in some communities on Thursday. And that is the biggest celebration we have. And then after two months and ten days, we have another celebration we call second Eid. So these two occasions are very important for us. And since you are present over here, and we are in the month of fasting. And this is the occasion because of the two, two guests, they are going to break their fast. Uh, it was uh, in my mind that I should mention to you about the fasting of the Muslims, the month of Ramadan or so. So at uh, the end of the program, we will uh, have our dinner and then we can continue as long as, uh, as we wish. And, uh, once again, I welcome you. I'm very grateful and thank you, thankful to you. You came here. Our community appreci appreciates very much. And we will have other occasions 
when we will invite and host you and hope you will come here and uh, and be part of us. Thank you very much. We are extremely grateful and honored to be here and to be able to break our fast or our hunger strike, whatever you want to call it, uh, here at this special place. Um, you know, I felt uh, when Elliot told me about this, that we could break our fast here, I felt very honored. And I felt that it was a wonderful opportunity. He would have two military veterans who were opposed to war, opposed to torture, opposed to Guantanamo and other places like that, uh, who could come to a mosque, a Christian and a Jew, and break bread with Muslims. And I felt that was very special, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, the men, thank you, the men at Guantanamo and also at Pelican Bay and other prisons where people are held in long time solitary confinement have undertaken hunger strike out of desperation. Because this situation has become so desperate and so unbearable, they are willing to do without one of the few things that they have in life which are precious, which is food. And they do this in order to call attention to their plight, in order to call attention to the horrendous situation that they've been placed in. As you heard in Guantanamo, many of the people have been cleared for release and they're sitting there <clears throat> indefinitely with no end in sight. No end in sight. So, I've known about this for a while, and, and when I heard that Elliot, my friend Elliot Adams, and two other very close friends of mine, Brian Wilson and Diane Wilson, were undertaking their own hunger strike, it inspired me to do something similar. But there's a big difference between the hunger strike that we have undertaken and why we have undertaken it and what is happening with the hunger strikers in Guantanamo and Pelican Bay and Angola prison and in some other prisons around the country. There's a big difference. The difference is that we are not doing this out of desperation. Let me speak for myself. I'm not doing this out of desperation. For me, it's, it's a kind of a sacrifice just to do without a future. I mean, it hasn't really hurt me physically. I've lost close to 30 pounds, almost 30 pounds. But it hasn't really damaged me physically. But I feel that sacrifice is something that we all need to do. We're not going to change the situation either in Guantanamo or here in this country without some kind of sacrifice. So I'm hoping that this is an example, and, and for myself also, to know that, all right, I'm gonna do without eating with loved ones, I'm gonna do without food for this amount of time. And when I started, I didn't know how long it was going to be. You know, I, I really had no idea because it was open-ended. I knew something had to occur that would give me a signal that Okay, just as I got a signal, Tarek, this is, and I like to eat. I, I really do. And for me to just jump into a hunger strike like this took something. It took an inner command, and that's what I got. You know, I got the sort of inner voice, whatever you want to call it, just telling me, Tarek, you have to do this. And once you get that, you go ahead with it. That makes things a lot easier rather than if you're thinking about it just mentally. So I hope that there's a couple of things that I would like to see happen from this. I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that we are not influencing the government by our fast. But what can influence the government is other people that come to be, become aware of this through the hunger strike. Through the prisoners' hunger strike, through our solidarity hunger strike that's going on, and people speak out, rise up, do whatever is necessary. Call the president, call your congressman, uh, come to Washington, attend protests, whatever. 
but I know that in order for something to change, we have to be willing to make sacrifices. In order for our children to have a decent world to grow up in, in order for people not to be imprisoned in such horrendous conditions as Guantanamo and Pelican Bay, we have to make, be willing to make sacrifices, and we have to be willing to take risks. And I'm 71 years old, so I don't go for the excuse that, oh, I'm too old to do that. No, you're, you have a body, we can do something. We can all do something. There are people quite a bit older than I am, and Elliot, who are doing significant things, who are making sacrifices and also taking risks. Risk of arrest, risk of many, risk of health and all that. So that's what I hope would inspire people. And that's my reason for doing it. The secondary reason, and not actually secondary, but primary reason, is that I know that the people in Guantanamo, the prisoners in Guantanamo, the prisoners in Pelican Bay, and in other places, will get word of what we are doing. And they will know that we are not being silent. They will, they will know that there, there are people out there that have a connection with them, that feel unity with them, that feel solidarity with them. They will know that they are not alone. And I think this is critical for these people critical for them to go on living, that they know that they're not alone. So that to me was a very important thing. And I guess that's about all I have to say. I thank you all for being here. I'm extremely grateful to the master for, for holding this. First, I want to say, uh, for me, it is very significant that we are here at a mosque, um, that there's a strong connection. It didn't take long for me to see the connection between Guantanamo, Pelican Bay. They, people talk about the sting operation here. It wasn't a sting, it was a targeting and an attack of this mosque. They framed this mosque. Um, and the targeting of the, uh, the Muslim community, um, they're all directly connected and part of, uh, uh, along with the condoning of sadism under the name to, um, torture. Um, and then part of the way we end that is by uh, refusing to cooperate with the power holders dividing us. The Muslims are our brothers and sisters. They are people. It's a radical idea to refuse to cooperate with their with the divisiveness that they are creating and somehow saying, oh, we can torture them because they're different. But they are our brothers and sisters. So it's very, very important to be here. Um, I think that we can do things. I'd like to see our communities continue working together. Um, do you want me to talk or should I uh, answer questions? I don't see very questions. Um, it's important that this is a, that this is the anniversary of the night that that, that um, our government attacked this mosque, um, and I think that this that we're involved. That Tarek talked a bit about what's ha what's happening in Guantanamo. I think looking around this crowd, I don't have to explain to you what's happening in Guantanamo. I don't have to explain to you what is happening in Pelican Bay. Um, I do want to say that, you know, this struggle we are in is not just a struggle for justice. It's a struggle for the soul of America, for your soul, for my soul. I had an interesting experience a while back. I was in an international um, workshop, and um, I took some people down to see the Liberty Bell. Uh, one was from uh, Libya and one was from India. And um, I have to admit, I was not impressed. Um, the quiche, the uh, key rings, the armed guards, like I was going to walk off with the Liberty Bell. Um, the whole thing was pretty, uh, it was pretty when my friends came around the corner and saw the Liberty Bell, they started to cry. And 
I realized how important that image of America has been around the world. It is the reason France gave us a statue of liberty to stand at the gates with our, head, with our beacon held a lot high to shine around the world. Now I understand that all the beautiful speeches were never created really. There was an ideal that gave it, that our founding fathers gave us a dream. It's our job to create that dream. That's our job is to create that dream. They didn't give it to us. They just gave us the dream. And right now, you know, we have our ups and downs. But right now, we are at a stage where a bunch of damn pirates, thugs, have stolen that dream from us. And it's up to us to recreate it. Us to reconnect to our Muslim brothers and sisters. It's us to, us to recognize that, that we need to build that. Let me talk a little bit about the fast. You know, this fast has been wildly successful. It's been wildly successful because of you. It's because of all of your work that has made so much difference. You know, people have said to me, well, what did you think about the Senate hearing? And I said, well, I think it's really exciting. And they said, do you think I'm making a difference? I said, no, I won't. And they said, huh? I said, look, it's really, it's, it's really exciting. It was because of the work that all of you did that a bunch of, uh, that a group of Democrats finally got their voice in wanting to have their name officially on record for, for closing Guantanamo. For 10 years, they've been afraid to speak out on it, and they've let the Republicans speak out on it. But that's because of the work you did to make them think they needed to speak out. Do I think it'll create change? No, I know it won't create change. And if you think it'll create change, I spent 10, 15 minutes in Schumer's office with his aide and on the phone to, Dur to Durkin's aide, Durkin was the one who called the hearing, trying to figure out if there was a transcript and if the and where the recording could be found. They didn't even know where the damn thing is. Uh, they aren't going to create change, but they will create change if we keep, keep building the social movement, if we keep talking to our brothers and sisters, we keep building relationships that we aren't allowed to build, um, and we make it so that they, let me put it this way, it's really simple. It is just plain simple. If the Democrats and Republican leadership have both believed that there were no votes for keeping Guantanamo open, no votes for continuing torture, and there was a, were votes for closing it, they would close that thing so fast it'd make your head spin. And that is our job. Build a social movement. Build the power. Build the power to put this country back on course. Yes, I know where it's been. And I know what our flag is flown over. But I also know there's a dream there that we can believe in and a dream that we can make happen. And that's what we're all doing. And that's what we're doing together. So it's been really, really exciting. Uh, when I started my section of fast, when Tarek started his fast, uh, nobody would have predicted that there would be a special envoy for to close Guantanamo. Nobody would have predicted there would have been a Senate hearing. Nobody would have predicted that on every street corner, like all of you have done, there would be talk about Guantanamo. It is just so exciting, and I thank you all for the incredible work you're doing. But I have to say, we're not there yet. As that saying goes, on the plains lie the bleached bones of countless millions, whom at the dawn of victory, where we are now, sat down and waited and in waiting die. Let not our bones be among us. Thank you so much. My name is uh, M.G. Ramjan Ali. I'm working on Bali Medical Center for Parking Services. My question is, long time is going on in America, this situation. Why not file the case for everyone together and then 
filed a case for government. The doing is bad stuff over and over and over. We can teach them proper way, then government can understand the why is doing so much corrupted. The Congress and Senator never do that again. I watching through the news, also radio, sometime Michael Barry, Sean Hannity. I listening so much stuff. But my question is right here, why not file we case against these people? We collect the money and file the case. And they're gonna be work because America run through case and so many stuff. If you do that that way, I think maybe change is a big change is coming up. Thank you so much. This is my question. <laughs> Thank you for your question. There, there have been legal suits against the government, and um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court, which it usually winds up at or a higher court does not always decide in the people's favor. The Supreme Court is a political animal like the rest of them. In other words, the entire government apparatus is corrupt. The entire apparatus from top to bottom is corrupt. So really, the appeals, even legal appeals to the government, don't go very far. And there have been some outstanding ones. But what will be successful is, as Elliot was saying, a mass social movement for change. And that's what has to happen. But people need to, as in my, uh, my feeling is that all of us, we know what's going on, or many of us know what's going on, there are millions who know what's going on, do not like it because we see the, the planet itself being destroyed. We've never been at this place before. We see wars, we see torture, we see racial uh, racism going on in this country. There's tremendous racism. There has been tremendous racism against people of color, and now Muslims are targeted. Another reason why Elliot and I are very happy to be here tonight. So the only thing that can change this is a mass people's movement. That means people being willing to put their bodies on the line. I'm talking non-violently. I'm not saying anything about violence. But people have to be willing to make sacrifice. You will not get change without sacrifice. It's as simple as that. You can come up with the greatest plan in the world, but it's going to take people. People out in the streets or people doing something effective. And uh, I think that's my answer to the, um, as far as a, a legal suit. Uh, the, the entire apparatus is rotten from top to bottom. In my opinion, it started out that way with the, with the oppression and the genocide perpetrated on the Native Americans. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of human work to do uh, as human beings. And I'm not talking about identify, I don't identify myself first as an American. I identify my, myself as a living being in connection with all living creatures all over in whatever country they come from or whatever species they are, whether they're dogs, cats, elephants, whales. We're all part of the same universal existence. And I, I identify with the earth as being a living being. And it pains me to see these living beings exploited continuously. So we have to identify that way. We have to identify as human beings, living beings, and establish our oneness and our unity and our solidarity with all that is oppressed now. I would carry on that. I want to back up and say something else. We talked about whether we make a difference or not. An attorney for one of the uh, people in Guantanamo told me that when he told his client that we were, that we were fasting, his client broke, up, broke into tears. That's powerful. The same thing happened in Pelican Bay. Um, going back to this question of the legal structure, I want to remind you that I can't remember the year that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was certainly made sense for that uh, you could hire people based on their sexual orientation. Twelve years later, the Supreme Court ruled exactly the opposite. And in that time frame, the U.S. Constitution did not change. 
the Bible didn't change, human sexuality didn't change, the only thing that changed was public opinion. Broad-based public opinion, we've seen a stunning um, social movement uh, of shifting people's perception of, of gay lesbian relationships. Uh, certainly mine has changed. Um, I wasn't uh, crazy, but I certainly thought, you know, um, it was just, uh, that's so, so at any rate, uh, from all my experience through the military and through politics, I believe strongly that if you have a democracy, no, that you only have a democracy if, let me start that one over again. If we talk about a democracy being the pe a, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, the operative word is by the people. By the people. People must step forward and be very active and demand their that their government be responsible or will not be responsible. And it will not be a democracy unless you are demanding your government to it. So I believe that if we can, I believe this is what we're about is that if we um, use, is recognize what is right and start demanding that our government do what is right by our standards, then we will not even have to file a lawsuit because we will change. You talk about extreme sacrifice and, 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 and social involvement or social movement. I, I'd like to go back to the Vietnam War. Let's remember, during the, Viet the Vietnam War was established under the premise of the demonization of, Viet of, of the Vietnam Vietnamese people claiming communism. Mm -hmm. Put that in contrast to the demonization of Islam, of, of the, the, the establishment that these Muslims are Islamist radicals that these Muslims are threatening the democracy of America by forcing or attempting to force Sharia on the United States of America in opposition or, or opposing the democratic establishment. Let's, let's make it clear that it has been recognized and known and said among many people uh, 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 and, and cultures that if, if you will, that the establishment of Islam is a true, or, or has been a true vision of a democratic establishment. Uh, 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 a system uh, 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 by, the, by the people, or, or, or decreed by uh, a, a, a leadership based on a religious premise. Of course, they say the United States of America is a Christian country and that the Constitution was based on. And, and, that's, and that's how the story goes. But the point that, or the, or the contrast that I'm, that I'm trying to make is that, remember the Vietnamese, they said that the Vietnamese was communist, uh, gooks, uh, all of these uh, de demonic type of uh, 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 nonsense or madness that you could exact against a, a people to subdue them or subjugate them or even inseminate them into your way of thinking. Now, what happened with the Vietnamese? So one, one of the extreme things that the Vietnamese had did to bring attention to the Vietnam War is that a uh, Buddhist monk would douse themselves in gasoline and set themselves on fire. Th th this is th the extreme that human beings had went to, went to, in, 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 in a fight to resist a democratic, what's supposed to have been a democratic government. Now, it's repeating itself. This same ordeal that took place in Vietnam is in the face of the United States of America and their people against the Muslims, against Islam, as, as they declare. Now, I seen uh, outside on the car. I seen an individual had on the car that said, "A uh, free Bradley man." Now I'm gonna talk about the social movement or social structure in the United States of America. 
I can guarantee you, if we did some research and we did some observations, let's go out to the street and ask 100 of common, what we call common citizens, who is Bradley Manning? Everybody, ask yourself your, this question in your mind. How many American citizens would know who Bradley Manning is? How many common citizens walking that street in any state would know who, or even know who's knowing this? How many would know? And that's, and that's what it's about, building that knowledge. Do you understand? So um, uh, my question is, is, okay, fine. My question is that, you know, I work for Occupy Albany. Occupy Albany had, had established a social movement. As, as far as we know, according to us, the, the American citizens, that Occupy Albany is dead. That the Occupy movement is dead. So my question is how you said about giving the social movement back in place, giving, giving it in gear. How do we do it? How, how, how do we build social movements? Um, I think we build them every way we can. Um, whether it be uh, a fast or carrying a sign or um, whatever we have to do. Uh, I don't think there is a clear path, but I know one thing. I know don't do anything and nothing won't happen. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely true there is a process to social movements, a structure for it. Uh, we can research it, we can study it, uh, and we can work at it. But most important is that we take an active role in uh, our culture and our society and our government. And by that, I don't mean running for office. I mean driving the government to move forward. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 